Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So hello everyone and welcome to PMP Live. My name is Leah and I'm a bookseller at Politics and Prose and I have the pleasure of being your host today. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in in this virtual format, which allows us to continue to bring awesome authors and their amazing books to readers like you. So I'm so excited to welcome our very special guests today, Kelly Yang and Lori Haas Anderson and our moderator, Sarah Enney. Um, and in just a few moments, we're gonna begin our chats. I just wanna share that for those younger viewers and those that may be triggered by the subject matter, we'd like just to warn that our discussion will probably will include the subject of sexual assault. Um, if you have any questions for our guests, you can click on the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen and you can add one there. And at the end of our chat, we'll have some time for our guests to answer some of your questions. Um, and as always, please remember that this is a creative safe space and we ask that folks be respectful of one another in their questions and comments. Um, also, you can click on that shining green buy button at the bottom of your screen to get your own copies of Kelly's newest book, Happy Book Birthday, um, Parachutes, and Lori's book, Shout, as well as all of their other extraordinary titles from our website. And of course, special thanks for all of you for joining us. Um, and supporting our bookstore. So now for the event you're waiting for, it is my honor to introduce author, podcaster, and journalist, Sarah Enney, who will be leading our chat today. Sarah is- yeah, Oh, go hi. ahead, go ahead, <laughs> sorry. We're so happy to have you. Sarah is the author of the YA novel, Tell Me Everything, and has contributed writing in anthologies like Because You Love to Hate Me. Um, she is also the creator and host of the podcast First Draft uh, and the podcast miniseries Track Changes, um, where she chats with other storytellers about the craft. Um, so now I pass it over to you, Sarah, take it away as I bring our guests onto the virtual stage. Thank you so much, Leah. Okay, and we're going to welcome our guests. I think they're getting virtually ushered on stage. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Hello, and here's Kelly. Um, I just want to really quick, well, first of all, it's so great to be with you ladies. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Politics and Prose. I'll say that as often as possible, Politics and Prose is an amazing bookstore and they've made this event possible. Um, so excited to, to ask you guys questions. I just want to clarify, I do have a podcast, First Draft with Sarah Any, where I talk to a lot of writers, including a lot of young adult writers. And Track Changes is a mini series I'm doing right now that explains the publishing process. So if there's any aspiring writers in the audience, that's what Track Changes is all about. You can check that out at First draftpod.com. Um, I would actually really love to start with um, having you gals introduce yourselves and just giving us a really quick soundbite about what your most recent project is about. Um, do you want to go, should I go first? No, Kelly, it's your book birthday. Happy Yay! birthday, by the way. So you're, okay. the, you're the queen today. Oh, I'm Kelly Yang. I'm the author of Parachutes, which is today, out today. Happy oh, birthday. God. <laughs> um, this is my first YA, so it's my YA debut, debut novel. And it's about two girls, Claire and Danny. Claire is a foreign exchange student from Shanghai, otherwise known as a parachute. She is, she is a girl who comes over on her own because her parents want her to get in a private American high school education. And she lives with Danny, who is her host sister. Um, Danny is an amazing debater. She's a Filipino American girl who really wants to go to Yale. Um, and both girls are living under the same roof but they don't know that they're going through very similar circumstances, dealing with a lot of sexual misconduct that is happening at their school. Um, it's a story that's very much mirrored on my own experience dealing with sexual assault when I was a student. And it's a story that I hope every teenager reads and I think it'll change the way they look at rape culture and hopefully we'll be able to change things together. Um, buy her book and read it. And then <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And and what it's just is so exciting for me, having been doing this for a while, to welcome new authors who understand these issues deeply. Um, and and you know, I I, I have a limited perspective. Um, and so when we can expand our storytelling circle so that we make sure that we're starting to get the intersections of experience, um, that's super important especially for those of us who live in the United States. Um, and it's just a joy, a joy, Kelly, to welcome you to our table uh, Well, and our family. Thank and our you family. So it's a pretty good place to be. 
uh, we're good people, and you, so are you. I just want to talk about Kelly's book, but let me just real quickly <laughs> say, so uh, about uh, 20 years ago, almost 21, this book came out, Speak, um, which was, um, I never thought it would be published, so <laughs> what did I know? Um, but I've spent 21 years, um, much to my surprise, uh, traveling the country and the world talking about sexual violence and most importantly, listening to other people um, who are survivors of sexual violence. Speak is not my experience. I, I was raped when I was 13, um, but speak is my emotional experience. I translated what it felt like to be silenced, to feel like there was nobody I could talk to. I didn't speak up for 23 years. And I transmitted and transmuted those experiences into speak. But now I'm a woman of a certain age flying my freak flag with my white hair, <laughs> right? I'm officially hair woman, y'all. Look at this. <laughs> I'm getting and, there too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's going to come faster. <laughs> <laughs> and so a couple of years ago when Tarana Burke's Me Too movement started to get more visibility because Harvey Weinstein's um, accuser, or the women he hurt, calling him out, I got angry. I got really angry and it was time for me to tell what happened to me. And that's this book. That's the new one. This is the paperback edition. This is Shout. This is my uh, memoir told in verse. It's what happened to me and it's what happened to a lot of other people. It's the stories that I've heard, obviously altered so that people are protected. And it's my rage. This is my rage poem filled with love. Um, and it's about how people like us and people like y'all out there, this is how we destroy rape culture and rebuild what it is to be um, a person in our world. Well, I am always all about celebrating uh, women being rageful and angry. It's a big motivator. <laughs> uh, and I personally can relate to that quite a bit. Um, as uh, everyone in the audience can tell, based on the introduction of these stories, we are going to be talking about sensitive topics. As Leah mentioned at the top of this podcast, or po <laughs> I'm so used to podcasts, um, at the beginning of this event. Um, so we are going to be talking about um, about rape culture and sexual violence in case anyone just needs to tap out and take a second. Um, do that now. But I'm going to start with our first question. And I want to talk about how brave your books are. I wrote these questions down. So if I look down, that's, I'm just making sure that I'm phrasing this right. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to talk about... Um, about you guys writing these books that I feel are brave. I don't. I don't know how many people, how many chances people get to feel brave while they're actively doing something. But um, Kelly, in your book, Danny and Claire, you have two two main characters, Danny and Claire. They each choose to speak out about the sexual abuse that they've suffered, and uh, even if it's frightening, even if the, if someone's not gonna, if the people around them are not gonna necessarily support or understand them. Um, and by speaking out, your characters inspire other people in their lives to do the same, um, to be brave in their own lives. And Lori. 20 years ago, writing Speak, you gave so many people the bravery not only to speak about their experience, but to write about it and to be public with it. Um, and I just, I wanna ask you guys about how you feel about the tension between writing like really deeply personal stories uh, uh, for, for personal exploration and personal he he healing um, yeah. versus the, you know, that's a very private thing versus the very public role that your books are now playing. Right. Um, so it was really, really, really scary for me. You know, it was um, my sexual assault when it happened to me, you know, it, it just, it devastated me. It took, took away my entire identity because I was a law student. And when you're a law student and you've gone through sexual assault at the number one law school in the country, and you've had the entire administration basically call you a liar and th threaten to take away your degree, it sort of takes away everything that you've worked hard up until this point in your life to build. Um, so I, I actually stuffed it in a shoebox. I buried it for a really long time. I um, ran away to Hong Kong for um, the, you know, really the last 15 years um, where I taught kids, I taught them writing, I um, did a lot of um, writing myself and just sort of tried to rebuild the pieces of me until I felt that I had gotten to a certain point where I was brave enough to talk about what happened. And I'm sorry if I'm getting emotional about it because this is the first time I'm talking publicly about what happened to me. And I really only got there through the bravery of people like Lori, of people who have come forward in the Harvey Weinstein case. Um, there have been several high profile cases of women coming forward against Harvard Law School, saying these are some things that they've experienced. And of course the Department of Education researched it and they, they, they 
decided that the law school had been doing this for a long time. And that's when it hit me that I wasn't the only one. And all this time, I had thought I was the only one. There was, you know, when something like this happens to you, you just, you do feel a sense that you are alone because the people in power tell you that you are, you are alone. And then you spend a lot of time, many, many years thinking that, and it, and it becomes, it becomes almost like something you accept, that you are alone, that, that no one else in the world could possibly ever understand. And because you were judged so harshly, you don't want to open up about what happened because you don't want to be judged so harshly again and have to be re-traumatized. So it really took the bravery of the women who stepped forward for me to realize, no, actually, I'm not alone. You know, this, this cave that I thought I was in here about all by myself, there, there's so many other people in this cave and I need to tell everybody what happened. I need to write it in a really emotional and powerful way so that everybody will know my story and that anybody else going through the same thing later on won't feel the way I did. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and we Ooh. all were comparing our tissue boxes before. I know. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, Lori, what do you, how do you feel about, I mean, Lori, you're, you wrote Speak, which of course is, is about your experience, but not, it's, it's fiction. And you, as you mentioned then, 20 years later, you got the opportunity to talk about your personal experience. How did you feel about moving into a more even personal exploration? Um, you know, it, it's really, really important for us to validate the experience of every survivor, right? And and to understand that, that everybody gets, you, you have something taken from you when you're the victim of sexual violence. And you, everybody gets to decide for themselves how they're going to operate, and and the, they get it. There's no one way to recover or to, or to heal or to grow, and there's no timeline. It's very very personal. Um, so so for me and and Kelly, I just I just have to respond to what you said. I'm sorry, Sarah. I'm going to take yeah, a little please. Script. <laughs> oh yeah. I just thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I was thinking a lot when I was, first of all, her book is amazing. It's so good. So good. <laughs> oh, just go get it right now. Like you can stop listening to us. Just go get the book and start <laughs> reading it. But um, well, your experience at Harvard Law is even more enraging because it's, especially when you look at the lawsuit and the fact that Harvard Law, Harvard stinking law had to own up to the fact that they were not treating the victims of sexual violence appropriately. And how many decades, generations of, of future lawyers and future district attorneys and future judges and future Supreme Court judges went through that system that clearly, clearly did not give a damn about what about survivors of sexual violence. And it's just like, oh, this is why we're in this situation right now. So I uh, just have such love and respect for your, the years that, that, that you have uh, been struggling with this pain and, and this trauma. And you, um, I hope, I know that your book, your book is, is, is starting today, gonna make a profound difference um, for this generation of readers. So thank you for that. Thank you so thank much. You. I hope so. It, I know, I know. Here, tell you. Um, so, so, so for me, um, you know, I, I was very clearly that I made a deliberate choice not to put my story into into the writing of speak. I had, had come out of a long, horrible depression and PTSD. My oldest daughter was entering middle school, and I finally went, "Oh man, I'm a mess. I need to start dealing with my mess." And so, I, I finally went into therapy. Um, at that point, and actually, Speak is is dedicated to my first husband and my therapist. <laughs> I couldn't have done it without her. Um, but the writing of Shout came from a very, very different place. I say, uh, if Speak was me trying to light a candle in the darkness, um, Shout is me trying to set an, the institutions on fire and burn them down. Yeah, that, and, and I do want to talk about institutions, you know, we, as we just talked about Harvard Law uh, and, you know, the institution of, of the patriarchy. But mm -hmm. um, in Parachutes, Claire and Danny um, both come up against, they come up against a, like a brick wall of institutions that sort of openly, very, very brazenly tell them to 
put yeah. their experience away, to deny their experience. Um, and in or and the the institutions and people that represent those institutions are doing it only to protect themselves. You know, it's so heartbreaking um, to read that. Um, but I want to talk about um, and and Lori, there's so there's stunning moments in Shout where you discuss experiences of having institutions shut down your you being brought there to speak about your work and then being shut down in the process of talking about uh, sexual violence and survivors. Um, I want, you know, and, and we're talking about young adult literature, which is a time when teens are really realizing that adults are flawed and uh, <laughs> maybe don't have their best intentions in mind. Um, so I'm just interested in how you guys wanted to explore that and if there's any stories you want to share about coming up against that, Lori, your stories from Shout were enraging. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'd, I mean, I'd love to hear you, you know your thoughts on that. I, so I, I'm going to keep my remarks brief because I really want the spotlight to be on, on, on Parachutes and Kelly Young because she's written an extraordinary book. Um, but I will say what I've learned from coming up again in institutions and censorship challenges, some successful, some not, over and over again, is that um, the, the reason that, that institutions, uh, there's two reasons that institutions don't want to talk about sexual violence. Number one is because they're benefiting from it. Right. You have we know that that that, that women and people who um, whose gender identity is outside the binary, they can certainly be perpetrators of sexual violence. But overwhelmingly, it is men who are perpetrators of sexual violence. And overwhelmingly, our institutions are still driven and policies are still driven by men. And there's a Venn diagram of, of, of the men who think it's okay to be, um, uh, to take advantage of other people's bodies and the men who get to make decisions in our country. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece is because we have a culture that has sex everywhere, but we've never raised a generation of adults who knows how to talk about sex in a, in a responsible, loving, appropriate, funny way. So when my, when my books get censored, when my school visits are canceled, when people pull me off the stage, it's because the adults in the room don't know how to talk about these subjects. And we can love and respect those adults because they didn't have adults in their lives who could talk about the subjects either, which is why the new book is called Shout, you know, because we have these conversations. In Kelly's book, I just was so moved by when the girls turned to their friends and their families and started sharing the, the horrible things that they've been dealing with, they were listened to. They were honored for the most part. And um, most people took them very seriously. And that was a joy to see. Yeah, and then um, back to what Sarah was saying about, I mean, that line that you said about how when Claire and Danny go to the administration and they're told to put it away, that's very much how I felt, you know, and just even that term to put it away. When I went to the administration, I really did feel like, you know, if you're going to be a successful lawyer, if you want to be a successful young woman, you need to learn to deal with this. There is a sort of element of if you can't handle this, you're not going to make it kind of thing. And this sort of double speak, this sort of weapon against women. I mean, that is like a psychological weapon against women. And I felt this way when I was a very young, you know, I was very young. I was very impressionable, very vulnerable. Here I am opening up about something. And I was, I felt like there was something wrong with me to even need to open up about it. You know, that I wasn't tough enough to just, I don't know, roll with it or something, to just move on, which is what a, what a, I don't know, a perfect, intelligent, strong corporate lawyer would be able to do, or some BS like that, 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 I, that I was made to believe. And this is coming from people that I really admired. Um, so really taking that whole dichotomy of what it means to be a victim, to be a survivor, right? And, and how empowering it is to be able to speak up. It doesn't make you weaker or lesser. It makes you stronger. And I really wanted to focus on that in Parachutes. And I wonder, Kelly, you know, they, Danny and Claire, are they, they're, they're really eloquent about their experience. They are really, and, and as Lori says, they're listened to and they have people in their lives that really connect with them about this. And I wonder how much you thought about your book as um, sometimes 
we never want to be prescriptive in YA. You want to respect your readers, of course. Um, but you were sort of showing what's possible, I think, to, yeah. to potential readers. How much did you think about that? I thought about it a lot. I thought about it a lot because, you know, I had those moments of doubt where, you know, enough people get into your head and like, did this really happen? Did this really happen? Did this really happen? And then you're like, no, but it happened. I was there. You know, yeah. I, you weren't there. I was there. You know, <laughs> um, And I really wanted to show um, anybody who's been through any trauma, you know, to believe themselves, to believe their own voice, to believe their own memory and their own recollection of memory, because that's the most powerful thing we've got. And if we let them screw around with that, then then what are we what are we as humans? You know, we can't let that happen. And we have to stand by ourselves first and stand with each other. Can yeah. I add can I add one thing to that? Just I really want to focus in on the institutions here. Because the situation that, that, that Harvard Law put Kelly in, which is, which is replicated by all kinds of institutions all over the place, is that they tell you to suck it up. They tell you this is part of, you, oh, you're young. Oh, you, you know, it's kind of your fault, you know. Um, and and <laughs> sure, you're going so young and right, put on your big girl pants and deal. Yeah. Um, and if you stay within the confines of that institution or that career path, then um, they've co-opted you. And they know, and the people who are kind of part of your circle, you, that, that you're not going to say you're not going to say boo to a goose. I'm trying really hard not to swear here. I really want to. Um, and and you're just and and that that you can be, continue to be victim. They will be able to take advantage of you in many many different ways. And if you drop out, if you leave the institution, if you change your your educational path, your career path, then they don't have to worry about you. Right. So they win. The only time they don't win is when people continue to speak up. And the more people speak up and share their voices, then that gives other people the, the, the courage to step forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, and and you know, speaking of, of inspiring other people to, to speak up and come forward with their stories, um, you know, Lori, you've now had a couple decades of talking to people who are moved by your book, and uh, as you say in Shout, in many cases, people coming and telling you their stories. Um, you've been very vocal about the fact that you welcome people's stories, and you seem mm -hmm. to be doing well with it. Um, oh, yeah. But I don't, I don't want to elide the fact that that's a very that's an emotionally heavy place to be in. And I just wonder, you know, now Kelly's beautiful book is in the world and I think a lot of people are gonna be moved by it. I wonder if you have any advice for people like Kelly and other writers who are taking this on about how to um, be emotionally safe with themselves when other people are gonna be bringing that to them. Radical self-care. <laughs> Okay. And, and, and that means, um, and, it, and it changes over time because our lives change as, 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 as we move forward um, and our family, family dynamics change or whatever. And you need to always, um, you know, be, learn how to check in with yourself um, because if you're not bringing your best self to any, any environment, any speaking engagement, any conference, then, then, then bow out. Right. Because because the people who want to connect with you have already been so deeply hurt, and you don't certainly don't want to hurt them again. Um, another quick tip: um, crying in the shower is great. <laughs> uh, it's my favorite place to cry. I and remember we, when I first put this out, um, just how scary it was that day. It was just you know my hands were shaking. I was writing the medium piece. I was putting it on Twitter. I know I was really. I mean, I, my my whole team was checking in on me. Like, are you okay? Um, and as soon as I put it out, um, people started tweeting me with all their own stories of similar things that they've been going through as students, you know, in in college, in high school, in law school, in grad school, whatever. And it was. I, I, I just, I couldn't even, I couldn't even do anything that day. All I did was just read the tweets. Yeah. You know, my heart was flooded with, with pain and love at the same time. So if, if you go to rain.org, R-A-I-N-N.org, you can find all kinds of statistics, but statistics are limited. Um, and when you hear all those kinds of stories that came in through your Twitter feed and all the stuff that I've heard for a couple decades, I'm firmly convinced that every single family in the United States has been touched by sexual violence. 
-hmm. And PTSD and traumatic experiences that don't are often generational. There's a, a, a diagnosis of secondary PTSD. So when a person's body is violated in a sexual manner by another person, it, often that trauma will then be passed on to the next generation. But here's how we heal. We heal by having safe spaces where we can learn the stories of others, feel strong enough to share our stories and cry. I love it. when I, We always bring Kleenex to my signing lines. Those tears are rain. Those tears are literally rain with one end that allow us to let go of the pain and start to nurture the next seeds that we need to grow within ourselves. And so when you're crying, when I'm crying, we're all just like on oh, the verge right now. And it's, especially when women cry, I think it's such a, a life affirming gift that we share with each other. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, but crying and laughing are very close to me. Yeah. <laughs> they're there. Yeah. You dance on either side at the same yeah. time. So that can be a beautiful experience uh, all at the same time. Um, I want to just ask, this is not, I mean, I'm going to ask this question really quick. It, it's a, it's a uh, broad topic, but, and then we'll get to audience questions as well. I promise we're getting to those guys. Um, but I just want to ask you guys, Kelly, you're an educator and Lori, you've been in schools for the last two decades. Um, so you both have a lot of interaction with, um, with this new generation. There's Gen Z and then there's whatever comes after. I don't even know <laughs> if we have a name for that yet. Um, <laughs> but I'm wondering how you guys feel about, um, you know, this is a generation being brought up in the midst of the Me Too movement where we're hearing a lot more voices and we're sharing a lot more stories and experiences and taking things seriously. And I just wonder how you two have, maybe seeing people talk about um, sexual assault differently or, or what you what your perspective is on this younger generation of people? Yeah, absolutely. I would first start off by saying that I think that this next generation, this generation is ready for these conversations. They can handle it. So if there's any doubt in your mind, like, oh, this is a sensitive topic. I don't know. I don't want to be, you know, corrupting my kids or something. Don't worry about it. You will be doing your kids such a service talking to them about it because this is the only way we can really have that important essential training for consent. You know, the, the, this generation of kids, they're, they're gonna have sex, okay? okay? But what we're not talking about nearly enough is consent. What, what is consent? What does it look like? What happens when you, you do it without consent? What does that look like? What are the, what's gonna happen after that? There are all these nuanced conversations that we're still not yet having, but the kids are totally ready to have. Then they, you know they're ready to have because they're having them with their friends. Mm -hmm. You know, trauma is now part of what a lot of kids talk about when they talk about sex because it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's happening whether I'm writing about it or Lori's writing about it or nobody's writing about it because that is actually what is going on in society. Every time you have teenagers having sex, they're going to have certain situations come up. So what I think we need to do is we need to go all the way and have those awkward, hard conversations. You know, we do all this technology training with kids like <laughs> zoom seminars how do you yeah. zoom how do you google classroom but we don't you do enough training in terms of like our bodies and our rights and what happens when we feel some of those rights are violated or when some before they get violated you know mm -hmm. before they get violated so that they don't get violated so that's what i would say is that we're ready to have those hard conversations you know we have books and tools to help us you know, to help us be that conversation starter, we need to have them. I'm just as excited for my daughter to read Parachutes as I am for my sons to read Parachutes because I really need them to read it, you know, probably even more than I need her to read. I really need them to read it. I want to make sure they absolutely understand what consent is. Yeah. I have to show you my shirt. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. <laughs> And this is something that's changed. Um, and, and I see like today's educators are, are beginning to, to, to record and, and administer school administrators that um, if you wait until kids are 16 or 12 to talk about consent, you've waited um, way too long. We need to start teaching consent when our children are developing language. I've got a, a bunch of grandkids now and um, they're all learning that they get to say no if they don't want grandma to hug them or kiss them or if they don't want their brother to throw himself at them, you know? It, that their body, they have body of agency over that body and when our kids say no, everybody has to listen. Yeah. 
And so there are age appropriate consent lessons that you just build that scaffolding as they get older. And then, you know, so that's happening. So there's like really positive stuff. The negative stuff that we're still not talking about is the availability that kids have with their phones to watch usually unethically produced pornography with no adult supervision. And the researchers that I work with tell me that they have a lot of data that's showing that boys are starting to watch porn because they're curious, because they're humans, um, around age um, 10 or 11, which is about four years before their parents want to talk to them about sex. So they're watching unethically produced, often very violent pornography. And if that's the only uh, sexual education they're getting for like four years, as their testosterone levels are increasing, our job becomes much harder to help them learn how to be like honorable, loving, sex positive, great men. Right. Um, so, uh, so basically we all have to get over our fear of talking about healthy sexuality um, and uh, do a better job than our parents did. Yeah, I love that. Um, uh, we're going to move to to audience questions. So I've been kind of monitoring uh, those questions and writing a few of them down. So we haven't gotten to talk too much about the writing process. Um, mm. I want to throw a writing process question at you guys, uh, which is writing middle grade versus YA. I want to just make sure everyone knows that Kelly also has a book called Front Desk that the sequel is coming out in September. Three key. Nice. I'm very excited about that. Um, so you guys have written across age range and many genres, but this specific question from the audience member was about younger middle grade versus YA audiences? How do you write between the two? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I have to switch gears in my brain. It's very hard. Sometimes I have to take like, an entire week off because um, I'll be stuck in like Mia's head and then I'll, it'll be really hard to translate to Claire and Danny. Although I do think there's like a lot of parallels between Danny and Mia. Uh, I always think of her as like an older Mia Tang and then I love her so much. Um, but yeah, it's really, really hard to get into the voice. I think the voice is the hardest. You know, the middle grade voice is very, very special and precious and innocent and, and wonderful, um, but it's unique. And the YA voice for me is a lot more aware, a lot more cynical, but also kind of innocent still, you know, there are things that they are optimistic about the adult world about, you know, they're, they're still optimistic about the adult world mm -hmm. um, because they're still growing and they're young adults, um, but they're already starting to be bombarded with a lot of signs that, that the world is not quite the kind of world that they grew up imagining. Um, so that was really interesting for me, that divide. Um, my middle grade uh, work has all done, been in historical fiction. So that kind of makes it a little bit easier, I think, for me to switch gears. But in terms of the craft, um, when I'm writing for the middle age kids, or middle grade kids, I, I tend to be more deliberate about setting my scenes because these readers need me to really, they need to be anchored in the time and place and the sensory details of any space, right? They have to, I have to give them that. Um, before I go inside the character. With my YA readers, I, I'm going to trust that they've had enough experience in the world that I don't have to fill in all the, I don't have to color in all those different places for them and let, let, give them kind of a gap where they can color in a, a kind of little bit of world building on their own. And I can spend more time in the interior and emotional lives of the character. I love that. Um, that's great practical advice as well. Um, so there's an audience question from Jade, uh, and Jade wants to know what your biggest piece of advice is when it comes to writing about sexual violence in fiction. Um, my biggest piece of advice for me was um, just not to be scared, not to be scared of it. Um, I wrote, uh, there's rape on the page in my book, um, which I think is, uh, you know, I mean, my editor definitely was like, that's, that's different and interesting. Um, so, you know, for me, it was just about portraying it authentically and portraying it um, honestly. You know, so I would say, be patient with yourself. You might not be able to write it very soon after a traumatic event. Um, if you have not had a traumatic event and you're writing it in terms of fiction, I would definitely read a lot and I would, you know, listen to the stories of survivors, listen to all the podcasts, listen, listen as much as you can to learn so that you can portray it with some authenticity. But for people who are going through it, you know, it took me, it took me 17 years to be able to write that one page, you know, and that's okay. 
Like it's okay to be patient with yourself. It's just like Lori said, there's no timeline on this. You know, you could write about it the day after, you could write about it when you're 99. It's, it's okay, just to be patient. And if I could just add something to that, um, I, I think that, that, you know, reading and listening to podcasts and all that is a good first level of research. Um, but if, you're, if you have not experienced sexual trauma and you wanna write about it, um, then you owe it to everybody who has experienced that kind of trauma to have, have develop healthy relationships with people who have been through that experience and sit down eye to eye and listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because if you're not willing to do that kind of work, it's emotional work within yourself, then, then maybe this isn't the right story for you. Originally, when I wrote Speak, uh, the first, and, and the, other th the other thing to tag onto that is that revision is your friend. You don't have to get it right in the first draft. We're not neurosurgeons. We have two <laughs> Um So originally, early drafts of Speak, before I started submitting it, the, the depiction of, of, of the rape was very graphic. But then I realized, especially 20 years ago, 25 years ago, that it would never be published. And so I deliberately toned down the, the and my main, I had my main character be um, under the influence of alcohol. So her memories kind of a little fuzzy um, because I wanted this to be a book that I knew people would hand to eighth and ninth graders. Um, when we did the speak graphic novel version, um, that the, the depictions of that rape was something that the artist, Emily Carroll, um, put a lot of time and energy into. Um, whenever you're writing about something that has been traumatizing for another person, you need to walk with humility and integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, we have another question. This is a question from Eliza. And Eliza has a question about disrupting systems, uh, disrupting the systems and culture of pervasive sexual violence that often feels overwhelming and hopeless. What do you believe are effective, actionable ways that educators and parents can teach and raise children to actively dismantle those structures and barriers? Mm, really great question. I think it's to speak up, you know, like uh, what we're doing now is we're having those awkward conversations. If you see things happening in your school, and so many people have tweeted that they have seen things happening in their school, don't be afraid of the administration. Don't be afraid of the systems and the powers that be because we are the powerful ones. You know, we collectively, our voice mm -hmm. is our armor. It's the only thing that we have to change things, to protect ourselves. Um, it took me a really long time to figure that out. Um, I'm so glad I went and pursued my case in the Harvard admin board, even though it nearly crushed me, but I'm so glad I did it. And I did it until the very bitter end. I went mm -hmm. all the way, even under the threat of not being able to graduate, which was kind of, it was, it was unbelievable at the time. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad I did that because I spoke my part, you know, I raised my voice. Um, I failed, but I have, I have that for myself. I have that victory for myself that I went and I spoke up and I did something about it. Um, and then years later, now I'm going to be able to make art out of it and write something beautiful, which will hopefully give other girls or boys, whoever, the confidence, the courage to speak their truth. Kelly, I don't think you failed. <laughs> I, I think Harvard failed you. I think everybody in that administration, everybody who kept their mouth shut, everybody who looked away, um, that's, uh, they failed you. And they failed every other, uh, every other um, victim of sexual violence at Harvard. Yeah. Um, I think that we have to learn to say the word vagina in the United States <laughs> and, and testicles um, and penis. Be, you know, we're writers, right, all of us, but if we can't even say those body parts that are like, we can say elbow, we can <laughs> say nose, we can say chin, we can, should say vulva and know where it is and what it's for. Um, and so many of us were have been raised in a culture that like, <gasps> right, you can't talk about those things. If you can't talk, if you can't even say those words to children without dying a thousand deaths, do you think they're going to have the confidence to come and talk to you when somebody touches their 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 penis or their vagina or their vulva? No, right. no. So let's kind of get down to and and you can and when we make jokes as adults, we we you know as we blush, and um, that's how we get through our awkwardness. And let's remember that our kids are feeling even more awkward than we are about this. 
Um, let, let, let's get the language um, and, and learn how to talk uh, about these things. Uh, that's, it's, it sounds like a small thing, but um, uh, disrupting institutions, disrupt, disrupting cultural, entrenched cultural systems, um, you have to just chip away at that wall. And, and even yeah. my own family, I mean, it was so hard for me, you know, Asian American, Chinese American families are very conservative um, with this type of thing. And my, my parents, I didn't tell them, I told them I was writing a Me Too story. But the other day, I was like, I had to brace them. I said, Mom, I talked about what happened to me at the Harvard Law School online. And she was like, oh. she was like, what? Why would you do that? And, and I think I was like, but you knew I was writing a Me Too story about schools. And she's like, yeah, but I didn't think you were going to go there. I didn't think it was going to be about your own experience and then she was so scared she was worried about my safety she was worried about she was really worried about me being a, you know re-traumatized again and having a lot of people say you know mean things or make fun of me or whatever um but then but then she went on twitter and she saw that like i don't know like eighty thousand people liked my tweet or some crazy number and she was like wow you know she was like wow i guess you can talk about this and i guess that people actually respond with love. And it was just, it was just the most, and ever mm. since then, she hasn't been able to shut up. So she <laughs> <laughs> I did get, there are a few questions um, in the queue, Kelly, about as a person of color, as a woman of color, and specifically an Asian American, how you navigated finding safe spaces to cope with this and to find support. Uh, I, I didn't really, you know, I had what happened. Um, I did not talk to a lot of people at school about it. I went and talked to the, um, the dean of students, the dean herself. I went and talked to the nurse, the psychologist. I sought help from officials. You know, I told maybe a handful of people, but it wasn't something that I felt that I could that I could actually speak about openly at the time, given the kind of hostility I was I was already facing from the school, sadly. Um, and then when I went to and then I went to Hong Kong for 15 years, and you know it was hard to talk about it there. Um, it was really hard to talk about it because people already had their preconceived notions of Harvard, and it almost like they didn't want you to burst the fairy tale for them, you know. And I was. It was hard. I was. I wasn't. I wasn't going to necessarily be able to speak about it without speaking about it fully, which is why I wanted to wait until I wrote this book. So really, I haven't really had a lot of communities um, that I found safe spaces to talk about it with. Yeah, and the hope is that there's more, more and more out there, right? Um, and speaking of that, you know, you, you did speak to it just a little bit, but wait, I had a great question about encouraging allies and how um, how we think, you know, it sounds like both of you were saying, like having frank and honest conversations with friends and speaking more outwardly can all encourage um, allyship. But I'm wondering if there's other ways that um, people who, are, who know someone who was affected by sexual violence can be a better ally. Lori, what do you think? Um, first of all, recognize that, um, you know, this, that, that healing, that timeline I was talking about, sometimes you go backwards. Um, the, the Kavanaugh hearings were incredibly distressing for a lot of women who had been sexually assaulted 40, 50 years earlier. Um, and, and, and so that stuff reawakens. So if you know of somebody who's, who's you know, a survivor, and, and especially when stuff comes up in the media... Um, check in with them, um, and but also um, say I care about you. Can we have a like a short, frank conversation? I I don't know. I need you to help me understand where your boundaries are. Right. You know, because I would love to just be calling. Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> but that might not be the right way. Um, and so uh, you know, walking in love, and your job is not as an ally or a friend to fix anything. Your job is to sit. Like get grounded in your silence and listen, actively listen. That's, uh, that's a gift. Yeah, that's so important. Um, well, we have, to, we have to start wrapping up, but I'm going to ask one last question. And it's a, um, I'm going to combine a, a craft question and, a, and an advice question. Um, because each of your books that we're talking about today, Shout and Parachutes, are written in very different styles. Uh, Kelly, you weave two stories together, which I am in awe of, an amazing feat. Um, and then, Lori, your uh, Shout is a, is a memoir in verse, which is very you know, stunningly done and really 
beautiful. But I'm wondering if you guys have advice for writers who are setting out to do those um, those types of writing. What would what would you tell your younger self, maybe, who at the beginning of that writing process? I would tell her to keep going. You know, um, don't stop, keep going. And you it might not seem like you can ever accomplish a book, but if you write, I promise you, if you write like a couple of pages and then it'll turn into a chapter and then it'll turn into 10 chapters and before you know it, it'll be a book. The other thing is with uh, with dual POV is it, it's so much work. It's so, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if I would do it ever again. I have to for this book because I wanted to show how sexual assault, sexual misconduct affected people differently with different socioeconomic statuses. You know, I really wanted to show that because Claire, you know, it happens to her, but then she moves to a hotel. Like she has ways of sort of escaping. And then Danny just has to live in it. And I was, I was that scholarship student. You know, I was that girl like cleaning houses after school. Like I was, I was that well, my parents cleaned in motels, not houses, but I was that girl just always wondering how much can I speak up? So I had to do it for parachutes, but I don't know if I would do it if I'm starting out. And I don't know if I would do it again, <laughs> to be honest. Um, for the writers in the audience, I think parachutes is a great mentor text. If you're trying to write from a dual person uh, POV, um, you just, and the way that the sections of the book often get handed off to the next, I mean, brilliant, brilliant. I want to go through with my, with my yellow marker. It was really, really well done. Um, and now I've forgotten the question. Oh, so for me, <laughs> sorry. Um, for me, um, you know, the poetry just started to go like gush from my head when I got so angry about Harvey Weinstein's reaction to the next latest wave of accusations a couple of years ago. And then the backlash started against the Me Too movement. And I just wanted to punch everybody I met in the throat. I was just like, Wah! and I was, um, anger is a really good motivator for, for <laughs> art. <laughs> and I just, I, when, when I, when I like, I tapped that vein, it just, it came out. It just, I think, I think that the thing that, that I don't know, every, first of all, everybody's process is personal, but for me, it was like, don't judge those early drafts. Just let it flow. Because when the judgy stuff starts, then you get tense. And you just want like that deep, dark magic that's in your belly. It's been waiting your whole life to come out. And it's not going to come out if you're judging. So just let, let, it, let it come out. Oh, I there think that's... Oceans. Yeah, that's wonderful advice for young writers. And, and um, if you're writing for yourself to, to deal or cope with trauma as well, that's so key. Just... Take a pen in hand and write from your gut and don't worry about, you know, like Lori said, re revision is your friend. You can always go back. <laughs> yeah. um, this has been an unbelievable conversation. Congratulations again, Kelly. The parachutes is so incredible. Um, everybody listening can can buy Parachutes and Shout and, and many more of both of their books uh, by clicking the green button that's down there. Uh, we did have one question about the Aspiring Writer podcast I mentioned. Just so you know, it's Track Changes. You can find that at firstdraftpod.com slash track changes. Um, it's been an honor to speak with you both. And thank you so much to Politics and Pros for making this event happen today. Um, and we hope everyone's staying safe and being well. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you so much, Lori. It's such an oh. honor. You are a trailblazer. I wouldn't be here without you. And I am just filled with gratitude and love for you. Thank you. So how about, we'll walk side by side now. Absolutely. All right. Amazing. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, friends. Take care. Yeah, be thank safe. you to everyone for joining us. All right. I'm just going to hop back on for one moment um, and say thank you all so much. Um, before we wrap up, I always like to throw out one more question. Um, so I just want to ask you all, um, we always like to ask at the end what you're all reading right now. Ooh. So um, we can go around. Sarah, since you're a moderator, if you want to share. Yeah, I'll share. Oh, speaking of anger and amazing women, I'm reading <laughs> Carrie Brownstein's memoir called, uh, yes, mm. Hunger Makes Me a Modern Girl. She uh, was one of the founding members of Slater Kinney, and it's an amazing book. Uh, so everyone should check it out. Um, I'm reading Laura Ruby's 13 Doorways, Wolves Behind Them All. Laura Ruby and I are doing an event on Thursday. Please join nice. us virtual via Belmont Books. We're going to support Belmont Books, so please join us on Thursday night. I just finished An American Marriage by Tayari Jones. <gasps> I love that book. It's so good. It so laid me. Oh, I can't stop thinking about it. It's so great. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you all so much for sharing. 
Um, and thank you all so much. Thank you, Kelly and Lori for joining us this evening and really sharing your stories and your insight. It, you know, it makes such an impact. And Sarah for being such an amazing yes. moderator. Thank, yes. you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Uh, um, and thank you all viewers so much for joining us today and participating and listening to this really important discussion. Um, as Sarah said, you can still click that green button on the bottom to buy Kelly's <laughs> new book, Parachutes, <laughs> and Lori Shout, as well as all their amazing um, and important books. Um, I hope you all enjoyed tonight. Um, you can find out about more events by clicking that follow button at the upper on top of our screen um, and check out our website for updated listings. And you can follow uh, Children and Teens Department on social media at, at, kids, uh, at kids and Pros. Um, so I hope I can see you all again in our upcoming events. It's so important to continue to speak up and listen to one another and show support. So it's truly an honor to be a part of this discussion tonight. Thank you all so much again, one more time for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Politics and Pros. And I hope thank everybody you. supports their local indie bookstore. We need you guys more than ever. Thank you so much for all the things you're doing for our whole community to make sure that we authors have the space and the ability to reach the audiences that need our books. Yeah, thank you all so much for that support. Keep reading and keep, keep speaking up. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.